Hello, and welcome back to another cello lesson. I'm Justin Leopard with ConcertDini.com, and today I want to talk about basic shifting. Now, this is something that we've already covered a little bit in some other videos, but basically we're going to be talking about how once you started to get down first position, you can move into subsequent positions. And if you watched our video that reviewed the Fantastic Finger Guides, the Fantastic Finger Guides might just be a fantastic finger guide for you to use as you're learning these other positions. But I'm going to be showing them to you today without that, the way that we would otherwise be taught how to do it, where we associate which finger we're changing to when we get to the new uh, position. I think that all came out terribly. But basically what that means is that in first position, our first finger the note that that's on, like on a D string, the first finger is on E. That that first finger is on E, that's first position, and anything other than that is going to be off of that. So for example, there's one note in between the open string and the first finger. So if your if your fing if your hand's position is down here, where the first finger is on E flat, which is in between the open string and the first finger, that's half position. Right, so that in that way we relate it to first position. In that same way, second position is well, it's actually two positions. So there's like low second position where your first finger goes where your second finger used to be. Then there would be high second position where um, your first finger goes where your third finger used to be. So I'll play for you so you can see. So normally in first position, F is second finger. That's F, but in low second position, I'll just put my first finger there and any other note I play, it's just the normal hand position where every finger represents a half step. So then in a high second position, that would be the position. Very useful. Uh, and the reason why they're second position, both of them, is because uh, these positions kind of derive their names from the violin positions. Violinists, if they were to, if you, if we were as cellists to finger the way that violinists do, we would be playing, right? Because that's how violinists do it. But it's a bit of a stretch, literally, on cello to do it. So we use this other fingering where our hand comes around a little bit more. It makes more sense for cello, and we use fourth position for the minor third instead of for the fourth the way violinists do. But that's why it's called second position. So continuing on, third position, there's two of them as well. And then, and then fourth position is the easiest to find, or at least I think so, because if you put your thumb in the crook of the cello and you put your first finger above that, then that's fourth position. So. That is a little bit of a recap, but that's not the topic of today's video. The topic of today's video is how you go about shifting in a way that you feel confident about where your finger is going to go and how it's going to sound good. So there's a couple of things that I'm going to talk about that'll make it easier. And to clarify, all of these things can be practiced independently of whatever repertoire you're working on or in order to practice whatever repertoire you're working on. And in this video, I'll primarily be just showing you the abstract ways that you can practice these techniques, but I hope that if you're having a shift in one of your pieces that you're struggling with, that this is helpful. So, tip number one. Remember that your elbow has to change at different positions. So what that means is you can anticipate what the next position is subtly with things that aren't your hand. So it's very important for this to get very used to the fact that like, your elbow might be balanced here for first position and just a little bit up for second position. In doing, and when you realize that, so basically, while I'm playing this, right, so that was a very non-musical way of just representing that I was on this note, shifted my elbow up, and then that made the shift easier. This works especially well if you're doing really big leaps where like the elbow position for up here is like that, but you can and you can see how the elbow kind of leads the way. So that's that's tip number one for shifting is getting really used to what the what the feeling of the elbow is. Now, tip number two is taking that concept and broadening it out. Basically, tip number two is don't limit yourself to thinking that there's actually a grid on the cello because this will start getting you in the idea that you played a note that was out of tune or you played the wrong note or the, the note was bad. 
try instead to adapt an affirmative approach. And I think I mentioned this in another video on Is Cello Hard? But this is the practical application of this philosophy, which was used by my cello teacher. So basically, what happens if you're playing a scale and you play a note and it's sour? Well, a lot of people just say, oh, I got that note wrong, and they try again. Well, how do you know that you're gonna get it right this time? All you did was get mad at yourself, but you didn't pay attention to what you were actually doing when you thought that you were playing the right thing. So this is where the affirmative thing comes in. Instead of saying, oh, that, that note was terrible, instead, look at not only what note you played, like, can you identify how sharp or flat it was, but also just how much can you notice about how your body feels in that moment? So you'll notice I can make that same mistake again because it's actually intentional for me. So I noticed that it's not only a quarter tone in between G and F sharp, so I know that I'm flat. So I know that the solution is gonna have to be to some degree that my finger is gonna have to go further down or further up uh, in pitch on the cello. And I can feel that, you know, it's, it's very close to my third finger. I'm just trying to pay attention to what the tendon in my arm feels like and what my shoulder angle feels like because all of those things are gonna be subtly different on this different note. And when I can pay more attention to what an intone note does feel like, that's gonna give me more consistency. So that was not a shifting example, but when we come to shifting, if you're, if the same thing happens, you can use that because you can say, you can say, well, let's, let's see how many times I can hit that, right? And then you're like, okay, so I know what that feels like. So now let me play a little sharper than that. And then you, you log that in your memory as being actually in tune. You log both in your memory. And that's how you're gonna be able to not only differentiate what you want from what you don't want, but it, it opens up all sorts of doors as you play more complicated music to doing different things. All right, tip number three. Tip number three is a very useful technique. I learned this from the classical world. People in there use it all the time. It's kind of a variation off of a technique that I find less useful where you basically do weird permutations of rhythms in order to get more comfortable with evenly playing notes. That can also be useful. And, and what I mean by that is that if you wanna play a scale, then you can practice. And also, if you, it's kind of the same concept as learning the flat notes, the, the slightly flat notes. If you can know how to play it uh, with these different 16th note rhythms off, then that helps you be able to play it on. But tip number three is actually shift, but don't play right away. You can take as much time as you want before playing to just get settled, but you still shift in time. So I'll show you what this means. So basically, so my finger's already in position. I'm already ready to play. I just haven't played yet. So this is supposed to take away some of the fear of hitting the note. And it's also supposed to just give you artificially, because in performance it wouldn't happen, but it gives you the time to really think about what you're doing. And I find this to be really useful because when you're just playing slowly, sometimes it can, you, you get kind of bored and then it's less useful. You're not actually paying so much attention. So this is a nice way of mixing kind of slow and fast playing where only when you're ready. You can take a minute, you can take two minutes if you really need to, but just think about it. All right, so the final tip I'm gonna give you is something that I've used a lot really recently. This isn't how I was taught it. This is maybe something that works only when you've been practicing all of the other things in conjunction for a few years. I honestly don't know. But for me, if I'm having trouble uh, achieving something, then I take a step back and I ask myself, is it that I don't know what the note is right because when you know what the note is like you know that it's an f sharp and that it's like third finger on the d string okay well that's a different ball game than you didn't know quite where like what the note was at all then you can ask did i actually know like where exactly it was because if you just kind of generally knew it's up there that's not really knowing what it is and then you can ask yourself was i exact with everything every subtle thing about each of my hands if you just take that methodically, 
then you won't have any mystery as to why you miss a shift anymore. So if I'm playing something and I didn't get the idea out that I want to, I want to take a step back and figure out, well, hang on a second, why didn't I hit that note? And what this looks like, this might be more of a case-specific thing to practice, but what this looks like is basically if... Like if I play that and I want to play that with total confidence, then every single bit that the right arm's doing and every single bit that the left arm's doing, I want to have fully locked in, right? And not just for generally playing that note kind of well. Those are super, super vague terms. But for playing specifically like with the tone and articulation that I wanted, the timing that I wanted, and maybe with the slurring that I wanted. So having a really strong conception is going to help you a lot because if you're if you're skipping that step then you're just going to end up overwhelming yourself okay so to sum up shifting is something that is essential on cello you got to practice it and you can practice it separate of your pieces the way to do this is just to systematically go through and learn what each of the positions feels like and then from there you can start using the other techniques that we talked about in specific instances where you need to hone it in even stronger or in your scales as you need to hone it in even stronger. I would say most of these techniques just boil down to slowing it down, making it easier on yourself, and actually just learning all of the tiny things that you don't even know and I still don't even know that I'm missing. Uh, that's why we practice is to figure out those things. So I really hope that this video is helpful for you as you learn cello, especially if you're working on a piece that involves some shifting or you're kind of scared to even try a piece that involves shifting. Certainly watch all our other videos. We have lots of cello lessons on here for you guys. Once again, I'm Justin Leopard with ConSordini.com. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.